I am joined today by Will Storr. He is a best-selling author whose honors include a National Press Club Award for Excellence and the AFM Award for Best Investigative Journalism, as well as an AIB Award for Best Investigative Documentary for his BBC radio series. But for our purposes today, he is the author of The Status Game on Human Life and How We Play It. Very excited to talk to him. Will Storr, hello. Hello, Heaton. How are you doing? I I am living the dream. I I mentioned to you before we started recording that uh, I was... I was thrilled that you you deigned to come on the program. Uh, I had multiple very smart friends talk to me conversationally about this book without even saying that I should try to interview you. Just they they wanted to talk about it like in a cocktail setting or a bar setting or whatever. Uh, and I I I went. This does sound interesting. I read your book. I loved your book. I feel like I uh, I got a whole new lens with which to look at interpersonal relationships in society. I don't know that I can ever quite think the same way that I did. And then I emailed you and you were like, sure, I'll come on. And I was thrilled because <laughs> I was going to read the book anyway. <laughs> but I was really happy you agreed to come on. Great. Well, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, can you can you give us a thesis to the book? What what is What is this lens that I now have through which to see the world? Well, uh, yeah, it, the, the whole book hinges on a very simple um, uh, observation, um, not made by me, but made by scientists, which is that um, the, the feeling of being of having status is a, is a human fundamental. We need it, um, and um, and our need for relative status uh, because it's fundamental drives a huge amount of human behavior, human history, human madness, human achievement, like it, 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 it's rooted in our kind of operating system as human beings, this desire for status. Uh, immediately, what I think everybody listening to the program who's not read your book is going to think when you say that is, yeah, vain people, insecure people, but I myself, I am not that driven by status. I'm, I'm not driving a Porsche. I, I, I am more interested in insert thing here. What would you say to people that believe that they are uh, inoculated to the status games that we're going to speak about? Yeah, I understand that. So, 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 so what, you know, what, what, when we say status, people usually just go to Porsche, um, celebrity, wealth, um, uh, but that, that, that's not what it is. The, the technical definition of status is the feeling of being of value to other people. Mm. So, so, so wealth, fame, Porsches are just some ways that we can measure our value to the wider world, but they're, but they're not the only way we measure our, you know, our value to our, our groups in the world. There are kind of infinite ways that we can play status games, uh, you know, the status games that are played by, um, uh, you know, religious people, um, are played around how, how, how much can you, how simple can you live your life? How much can you d deprive yourself of? And that's the way that they measure status. So, 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 so. Yeah, it, it, it's not about, um, it's, it's not that the claim isn't we all want to be famous and rich. The claim is we all want to be perceived as being of value to our, to our groups. Yes, uh, which, which makes a lot of sense to me. And if, if, I, if I understand kind of how that, um, how that maps out in your book, there's three strategies that everybody employs more or less constantly in order to try to maximize that value. There's dominance where we, we bully people or we're threatened to bully people, whatever that is. There's... Uh, prestige or success or competency, but but doing something impressive, and there's uh, virtue or purity or morality or something to that effect. Um, are, are are those the three categories by which we're able to obtain status? Yeah, I mean, you know, he, humans are so status obsessed, um, you know, subconsciously and and consciously that that that, that we'll kind of look to play. To, to, to gain a sense of status anywhere anywhere we we can and and so we we play status games with things like age and beauty um in some contexts age is good in some contexts age is bad you know <laughs> that kind of thing um but 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 broadly speaking social life as you say is made up of these three major different kinds of status games and that's because of how we've evolved um so we've been playing dominance games like lots of animals for millions of years and dominance games are about pushing each other around so you know when two hens come in contact to each other they'll peck at each other until the pecking order is established and that's how they'll play status games with with physical pecking and and, and so humans have done that for millions of years we still do that today and it's not just physical violence it's the threat of violence but it's also social violence so we're mm. social animals so the threat of ostracization name calling that that's a way of playing dominance games um but but when we when we kind of 
you know, became human, we, we had to figure out ways of playing status games that weren't about aggression because you, you can't, you can't just go around just attacking each other all the time because that's miserable. <laughs> you can't live together in, in, in communities to, and do, to do that. So we had to, we, we had to come up with new ways of, of playing these status games. And, and the new ways, it was kind of evolution's way of kind of incentivizing us to, 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 to behave well in the context of groups, you know, these great cooperative groups that define human life. And there are two ways of, it's, 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 and essentially, as I said before, it's like, it, it, it's, um, you, you're rewarded for being of value to your group or your tribe. And there are two ways of being of value to your group or tribe. The first way is, as you say, is by success, by being competent, by being really good at stuff. So being, by being a great hunter, a great honey finder, a great storyteller, a great sorcerer, you offer value to your tribe because you're really good at stuff, but also because you're teaching other people, you know, other people are learning from you. So, so then you raise in status. But the other way is of being virtuous, by being courageous in battle, by being um, uh, somebody that knows all the sacred beliefs and follows the sacred beliefs and polices the, polices the group. So you can think of um, the Pope or the I was going to say the Dalai Lama, but that's kind of changed recently. <laughs> but so the, the Pope, the, the, the Pope is a kind of a, is, is a, is a virtue status superstar, as is the Dalai Lama, to be fair. You know, the, you know the, these people are, are, are not, um, uh, uh, don't, haven't received massive global status because they're competent at anything. They've received massive global status because they are um, uh, virtuous. Hmm. Well, so in, in terms of how that plays out day to day, I, I am unlikely to hang out with the Pope or the Dalai Lama, although... Yeah, yeah. Would love to if the opportunity arises because it would increase my status. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, let's say I'm hanging out on Twitter. Uh, I, like, and your, your book immediately made Twitter make sense to me when I read it because, uh, first of all, I, I I'm going to try not to be a dick about this, but if if you're not doing very well in other aspects of life, Twitter's a very easy place you can go to try to supplement your sense of status, and you can do so by just fighting with other people, which I would take to be a kind of dominance play of, I, I destroyed him. My, my arguments about why this thing no one cares about except for us dominated. But then also I could, I could come in and I could try to verbally police people. And I could say, take your pick. That's sinful. You shouldn't say, God damn it. That's, that's blasphemous. Or, um, you know, really, nope, that pronoun is no longer used. We use these pronouns now, what, whatever the thing is. But uh, if, if I'm playing the virtue game, then I am, uh, I'm enforcing the rules of my tribe and I'm showing that I am, I am pure. And by that purity, I should be accorded status within our community. Absolutely. And the tell is the, the point. So, I mean, what, what's really interesting about, about social media is that they've kind of figured out by instinct and, you know, refinement over the years, what, what humans want. And, and, and so, you know what happens when you connect i think four billion people are on social media by by the latest statistics there's over half the population of the world or around half the population of the world and what happens when you connect you know billions of humans together is they immediately play status games um and and, and what you said is quite right it's, you know it's dominance virtue and success that's social media is pushing we're pushing each other around we're virtue signaling but we're also showing off about our successes by you know photographs of our amazing holidays and flat stomachs on Instagram, if we're lucky enough to have those things, um, uh, you, you know, oh, I'm so humbled by this book deal I've just had, you know, all that, all that good, good stuff. And, and you say, you know, the, the, when you talk about the virtue, you know, the, the virtue games, the tell is in the, the, the points, you know, how social media have figured out um, what we want is likes, retweets, these signals of status. So when we're policing pronouns, whatever the thing we might be doing, what we get is lots of people underneath going, yeah, you go for it, you go, amazing, yes, queen, or, you know, with the retweets and the likes. And, and so, so that's the status rewards that we're getting for, yeah, for, for, for exercising our virtue status in front of our group. Uh, it is rather sobering to apply your thesis to your own life. Uh, <laughs> so I, I started just thinking about the book so... Um, uh, the, the show that you're on, it's my full-time job. Uh, it's, it's got thousands of listeners, but it's not a mega sensation. I'm not Tim Ferriss or anybody like that. And particularly in the world of politics, because we cover politics a lot, I am frequent to point out, um, you know, yes, this isn't a juggernaut, but it's all, I'm not a partisan hack. I'm doing the real earnest stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm it, it, at least in some capacity, I'm doing a virtue play. I'm saying I am not as successful. I'm not going to compete in the success realm with, uh, you know, CNN or MSNBC or whatever, but I can outcompete you in terms of virtue. Therefore, I can go to bed thinking I am very good at this. 
Yeah, I, I think there's an element of that, but 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 I also think that what we do because because I do a similar thing. I'm, I I I guess I'm in a similar place as an author. I'm I'm not uh, famous. I'm not going to get stopped in the street very often. But but I make it. I make a living. I, I sell a few mm-hmm. books. Um, and, and so so what I tell myself, you know, when I compare myself as we do to much more successful authors, is ah ah ah. But 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 they're you know but they're these great you know best selling authors. That, you know they they're. they're, they're kind of playing to the gallery and doing right. this great commercial stuff. So what we do is we kind of, you know, I, I think the, the way to understand status games is, 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 is that they are kind of almost infinite status games. And, and, the, and, the, and the, like writer and podcaster, yes, it's a great big status game. But really what we're doing within that is we're playing kind of, um, you, you're not competing with every podcaster in the world. You're, you're competing with the other podcasters that you think are, 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 are a lot like you. So the political, smart podcasters those are the ones that you're going to be comparing yourself to you're not going to be comparing yourself to joe rogan i assume or um or or like if there were a yeah or or, or people like that so so, so, a makeup tutorial podcast or something i wouldn't i wouldn't be comparing myself yeah but but so yes it's a virtue play but what you're what you're also doing is you're 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 defining your success game you're saying well okay you know i i i i'm not measuring my success by raw listeners i'm also measuring my success by quality and intelligence So I, th- I think that's the, that's the kind of thing that we do a lot, and and, and I completely guilty of that. Um, well, and I think we all are based on your book, right? Like it's they're, they're yeah. really. I I get the impression, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here. There is no cessation to this. There's there's not a a satiation point at which I go. I uh, I've I got my Grammy, and forever my status is insured and enshrined, and now I can check out and just be content and happy. That never quite goes away. We're always, I'm at the retirement home and I can, I can walk a little better than Zeke down the hall. Therefore I am the higher ranking old person. Like it never stops, right? It never stops. No. Uh, and, um, you know, when psychologists try to, it's a very interesting one study where they compared our sort of desire for power versus our de- Design for status, and what they found is that you know some people, like, like a minority of people, have an almost unlimited desire for power, and those are the people that will be world leaders and CEOs. Um, but most of us, the desire for power levels off quite quickly because with power comes stress and hassle and responsibility, and oh my god. Um, but but the desire for status never levels off, and and the way to understand it is um, it kind of ratchets up status. So it's not like everybody wants to be Beyonce, everybody wants to be Taylor Swift, everybody wants to be Joe Biden. It's just that we want, we, we want, to, we want to, 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 to climb up the next step of the ladder and the next step of the ladder and the next step of the ladder. So whenever we get there to the next thing we want to do, we, it's great for a moment, but within 10 minutes, we're thinking about, oh, actually, I want the next thing now and the next thing now. And that's the thing that never levels off. We, we never stop wanting to get up to well, the and, next And a, a fear thing. that our status will atrophy or be taken from us, right? Like there's also no permanent security. There's none because what is it? I mean, st- status is, is the prestige forms of status. Well, actually, all status it is given to us by other people. So, so, so we can't own our status. I mean, you know, um, um, there's no status vault. No, there isn't. Even a Grammy, be- be- because the, the next year someone else is going to win the Grammy, and then who are you? You know, and then so, you're a has been. Do you want to be a has been? That's not fun. You are not fashionable anymore. Yeah. So, 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 and also, as I said before, like you're comparing yourself to your. We compare ourselves to our peers. So, um, and that's why for people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they're, they're never going to be satisfied because Jeff Musk and um, uh, Jeff Musk, Jeff Bezos. That, that, would, that would be the celebrity couple if they become gay and create the, the rich person archon of, of Jeff Musk. Yeah, they're, 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 not, they're not saying we're amongst the most successful and wealthy people in the world. Aren't we great? We can sit back. They're comparing themselves to each other and the people around them. And, you know, Mark Andreessen and whoever else might be these sort of tech billionaires. Um, so, so they're constantly, you know, feeling like they have to shore up what they've earned and, and make sure it doesn't go away, but also get to the next thing and get to the next thing and get to the next thing. Okay, great. So um, to, to borrow an economic analogy or economic system, in economics, we have relative growth versus actual growth. Mm. So um, we, we might be looking at a given policy and we can say, um, this policy made rich people get richer twice. Like they got incredibly wealthy. But if we look at the overall statistics, everybody got wealthier. Uh, and that would be actual growth. But if we're just looking at the the gap, the inequality, we're talking about relative growth. Um, how does that work in terms of status? And and what I mean by that is um, I live in Austin, Texas. The aforementioned Joe Rogan lives in Austin, Texas. Right now, I'm hanging out with other podcasters and independent content creators that are within the same general realm that I am in. And I feel happy and secure and valued. Were I to go to hang out with Joe Rogan, 
would I suddenly, even though I've sort of upgraded in terms of prestige, would I then feel horrible because the gap would be so huge that I would feel like a nobody? Yeah, because you're. A, it's interesting. It's because you're a podcaster. You probably would feel worse. Like if you if you were just like a like a, like a non creator and, mm. and and weren't didn't feel we were competing with Joe Rogan and suddenly became mates with, mates with Joe Rogan and you'd feel great because like I'm, I'm mates with one of the most famous podcasters in the world. But because you're a podcaster, yeah. you, you're going to feel crap because because like he, he's up there and you're and you're down there. And 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 this does you know when when this when this effect is tested, it, it does it does measure out like um um. Uh, like what one of the tests is is when they look at um uh, economic growth in uh, across nations when it go it go it goes up and up and up um but happiness doesn't go up and up and up mm. as long as the nation you know it's like US or the UK it's fairly well established um uh, people's happiness doesn't go up with 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 wealth because everybody's wealth is going up so you know it's it's the relative differences that make people um interesting happy. So if I'm understanding you correctly, because I've got a a pretty good command of the data on this, like in the United States, um, even within the lowest quintile, people generally have air conditioning, a refrigerator, a car, a television. The the level of uh, actual wealth is much higher than it's been in in American history to the point where a poor person today has it better than Rockefeller did back in his day. But in terms of our status that it's a relative game. It's it's how yeah. am I doing compared to the other people? I don't care that we all have refrigerators. I care that that guy is going on Instagram to brag about his vacation. Absolutely, because then you'd have this. Because if it wasn't that way, you'd have this weird situation where the, some of the poorest people in America would be happier than some of the rich people, richest people in America two hundred years ago. And that's right. not true, is it? Like, yeah. like, you know. So so so, so, so yeah yeah it's, yeah it's relative. So it's all relative. But as I say, with, with always that caveat that it's relative within our group. So so so, so the good news of this is that is that when you have sort of large inequality in a nation, the people at the bottom of the ladder aren't going back their days usually comparing themselves to the people at the top. That they aren't being needled and depressed and maddened because they're not Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. They're just a cleaner or whatever it is. Um, they're comparing themselves with the people around them still. You know, so so so, so you can be you can be a, a cleaner and be perfectly happy as long as you feel like you're an above average cleaner. You're good at your job and you're earning a uh. bit more money than the cleaner next door to you. Yeah, you, you could be you, you can you know potentially feel, feel feel perfectly satisfied with your life and and, and as you say, I mean, we, we live in, a, in an era now in the West where the vast majority of people do have enough to live on and sustain themselves and feed their families. So, and once you've got that, everything else is status. Uh, okay. I think this, um, I think this answers another question I had, which was, um, I am assuming that your status is more important to you relative to your group than it is to society. And yeah. so, uh, for example, I am guessing that I would, most people would actually feel happier as the senior respected bricklayer within their bricklayer company than they would as the junior gopher in the hedge fund. Like if I'm if I'm the lowest guy in the hedge fund and I'm making you know five hundred thousand dollars a year, but they're taking pot shots at me and I I don't have much clout, I'm gonna feel like I have higher status as the head janitor at my school because I, I don't know is is that the case? Are we that's, is is it right. society as a whole or is it just my immediate environs? That, that's exactly right. It's, it's much more about the immediate in, environment. So your position within your socioeconomic group is, is a far greater predictor of happiness and well-being than your position in the overall scale, bottom to top in, in a nation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK. So uh, in terms of religion and, and politics, um, I, I think about tribalism a lot. I haven't thought about um, hierarchy as much uh, until I encountered your book. So previously, I would have said that people get bent out of shape if you question Lutheranism or capitalism or whatever the thing is. The people get bent out of shape because we are tribal apes. And when you question the sacred emblem of my my tribe, you are threatening my tribe. And so I have a defensive response, a, a coalitional defensive response. But given that you're you are looking at status, do, do you have an alternate explanation? Is there is there a status element on why people get bent out of shape about politics and religion? Yeah, yeah, because because you know, lots of status games form around belief. You know, and these are these are these are some of the most dangerous um, status games. So, in the book, as you know, I um, look in detail at um, the case of an anti-vaxxer, a young woman called Miranda Dinda, um, who 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 um, who, who uh, she was having her first child. She was eighteen years old. She um, wanted to find a midwife that would give her a home birth, and she found one and. 
midwife said to her, have you ever considered not vaccinating? And she was like, what are you talking about? Not vaccinating? Why would I not do that? She said, oh, just Google it. Google it. So, of course, she Googled it and found and found lots of inf information online about why she shouldn't vaccinate. And um, she joined this um, Facebook group called um, Great Mums Questioning Vaccines. And um, she described this kind of thing where, you know, it is this kind of belief based status game where to get access into the group, which she wanted because she wanted to be surrounded by these powerful, strong women that she admired. And she was 18 and they were all had numerous children. You have to believe. So, 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 you know, she decided, OK, well, maybe maybe I, 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 you know, I believe this thing. But to earn status within that group, it wasn't just it wasn't good enough just to believe. You had to, actually, you had, to, you had to kind of ha, kind of let that belief inhabit you in a, in a way yet you, you know she had, you, so so what, what they were doing was going out into the world and having arguments with their cousins and arguments with their doctors and coming back onto facebook writing up the report of what they've been doing and they would get applause and yeah you go girl and it would you know they'd rise up in status in the group and so 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 we, so we see this very typically in 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 groups you know and religions are an example where um you know i also talk about um an anthropological study of um islamists in in Africa in the 1970s, um, this guy was trying to figure out why these young men were drawn to, to, to Islam. And it was because Islam was a status game. Islam was the best, uh, was the game that offered the best level of status in that poor environment. It was a European outseller or you're a, you're, you, you're a Muslim and Muslim offered more status. So, but in order, in order for that status to be real, the belief has to be real. Like, like if you don't believe every word of the Quran, then, then there's no status in your game. So, so it's a precondition. It's a precondition from Miranda Dinda to earn that status that she desired for those other mothers, that she believed that vaccines weren't real. And so when somebody comes along and says, well, I think that belief is nonsense, then it, it, it's, it's not just an attack on the belief. It's an, it's an attack on your status. Because your, your status it's is then illusory. Your status yeah. is not real because it's rooted in something that is nonsense. Yeah, that's yeah, fake. So, so, so that's why we become so completely maddened. Uh, when when people um, contradict our you know sacred beliefs, these or you know we don't get annoyed when people tell us that the length of the Mississippi River is wrong, or you know we, we might get irritated. Or, you oh, know, I do get I do get really yeah. irritated, but fortunately, it's it's a fairly limited set of people that are going to argue with me about how many states yeah. there are and things like that. But the kinds of beliefs that drive us completely to distraction are the ones that our status and identity is rooted in. Because when people say that's not true, they're saying our that they're, they're, they're basically. Um, declaiming, you know, or, or, or deriding or dismissing our claim to status. Hmm. So beliefs can be a claim to status. Okay. What, what is the difference between popularity and status? Are they synonymous? Are they different? Um, well, I suppose... Because uh, I, I guess if you're popular, you're going to have status, but you can, yeah. you can have status and not be popular, though. Like a dictator well, has massive status, right? But yeah. they're not necessarily well liked. You you bring up then Prince Charles in your book, yes. uh, who's now King Charles. So he was yeah. kind of weird. It's this weird situation where he's like kind of low status in the family because he's yeah. nobody likes him. And he's not the king, but he's super high status in society. So is this the yeah, bricklayer like, thing? Would it be better to be a brick than the, the chief bricklayer than the the heir apparent? <laughs> Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple of different things going on there. So one, so popularity obviously isn't a technical term. So, so the, 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 humans have two great drives. One of them, obviously, status, which is what I've written my book about. But the other one is connection. So, you know, a part of being tribal is that we want to connect with other people, we want to feel like we belong. Um, so, so, there's, so, but once we've connected into a tribe of people, we want to earn status. It's not we don't, we don't just want to be liked. We want to be liked and valued. It's not no, nobody wants to be thought of as like likable but useless. Oh, there he's a nice guy, but he's rubbish. You know, like nobody wants that. <laughs> you know, so 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 we want so so, so popularity is a is a kind of you know non technical term. But, you know, it could be a measure of either of those things. It's probably a measure of both of those things. If people think we're nice and good, valuable, then we're popular. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the other thing, the, the prince, well, why I call them but the Prince Charles paradox. Um, y you know it. You've got to look at the the kind of history of of humanity, really. So when we evolved in in, in the great in the you know the, the hundreds of thousands, millions of years in which we were evolving, our brains were evolving. Uh, it was in the context of mobile hunter gatherer bands, right? So, so 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 that was the original status game. It was it was our literal tribe, and the the more value that we gave to that tribe, the more status we earned. The the, the more food we'd 
um, get, the better food we'd get, the safer our sleeping sites, so everything would get better. Um, uh, so, so, so but, but, but there weren't any kind of formal institutions in that world. We, it was just the status was like, how other people are treating us, for how much deference, how much influence, you know, how much food they gave us. And that, 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 that was, that's, that's how we've evolved to play status games. But of course, around 10,000 years ago, we discovered agriculture. We, we, we settled down. We, um, uh, um, we, we, did, we, we, we got drunk on kind of private property and all that stuff. And that was the beginning of, you know, civilization as we know it. And we, we, with that comes kind of formalized status games. So, 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 you know, we, we, we began to, we began to uh, actually say, well, actually, you, you know, you, you've earned so much value that you've got this title now and we're going to put a crown on your head. And so, so there's this kind of formal status game. So, we, we, so, so in, in, in the modern world, we're kind of all, we're almost playing t two status games at once. We're playing informal and formal games. So, so the informal game is the real status game. That's what, what other people actually think of us. Um, but, but the formal one is, is the rank that we've earned in society. So, so you can perfectly imagine, you know, it's like the office, like David Brent in the office or the Steve Carroll character that you have in the, in the, in the U S who's, he's the boss. But everyone thinks he's a total dick, you know, so, mm -hmm. so, he's, so he's earned some formal status, mm -hmm. but the real status game, the game that exists in the people, the minds of the people around him is actually low status. And that's the paradox you get with um, civilized society, because we have these institutions that have formalized the status game. But, but, it, but, but, but just because we've achieved high status, it doesn't actually mean that the people around us think of us in that way. Are we okay? Is it that is it that we're constantly playing a status game and we're altering tactics, or is it that we're playing multiple status games simultaneously and we orient our energies towards that which we feel is most advantageous to us? So is is Steve Carell in the office playing the same status game as Jim, uh, and 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 they're struggling for formal power versus popularity, or is it that um, uh, I, I can go? I'm not going to win at popularity, but um, I'm the son of a duke, therefore I can win at that. Well, they, you know, they, 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 but they presumably, if they're working in an office environment, they, 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 they're, they're, they're always competing for the promotion and for more money and, and to get that formal rise in status. But, but what they don't understand, especially the Steve Carrero character, doesn't understand is that it's not just about the, 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 the pay packet and the badge on the desk, the, you know, the, the, the job title. What's really important is what other people actually think of you. You know that that that's that that's the stuff that's really going to make you happier and, and, and increase your well-being. So so and, and that's almost the comedy of The Office is that is that uh, certainly the UK one that I'm more familiar with is that David Brent is just desperately trying to achieve that informal psychological status. He wants other people to think he's great and amazing and impressive, but he just fails spectacularly <laughs> at that, you know, constantly. So, so, so yeah. Um, I, I get really irritated when I'm waiting in line at the post office or I'm in a traffic jam or I'm at the airport, uh, either going through the TSA line or when I'm sit in my mm. seat and they won't let me on my laptop or whatever. I've always assumed that that was, when I think about it, a kind of fight or flight instinct where I'm feeling confined and therefore powerless. And that's why I'm angry. Is there a status element to it? Is it that when I'm in line, uh, normally I, as a six foot tall white guy that wears suits, am accorded a certain level of status, but now I'm treated like cattle and that pisses me off. Is it status? Well, I, 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 I wouldn't know for sure, but I, I, I would, I would speculate that it is partly about that. Yeah. You know, um, def definitely. I think, um, you know, we are, the, the neuroscientists say talk about this 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 thing called the, the status detection system the brain has so subconsciously we are constantly scanning our environment for signals about how much status we're, we're being afforded uh, you know it never switches off you know you, you get into an elevator someone stands too close to you you know you feel like well, you know what you you know that, that, that's that's that, that's an insult um th there was this great study i write about in the book um where they looked at um people what happens when you pour everybody a glass of orange juice and one person gets very slightly less orange juice than everybody else, they become preoccupied with it. You know, they get, they become frustrated with it and irritated with it. Why? It's because the status detection system has taken that as a measure of status. And that's why road rage incidents happen is because it's not just, it's not, we don't, we don't get angry. We get angry a little bit because we feel perhaps the other, the driver's putting our safety at risk, but a lot of it is actually, how dare you? You know, it's a status pursuit. So, 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 so in the TSA queue, yeah, I, 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 um, 
I think it would be oversimplistic to say it's all about status, but I, I certainly think it, you know, it is a lot about that. You know, mm. I, you know, when you're lucky enough to fly business and go through the quicker route, it feels pretty good. <laughs> you know, mm. like, you, like you definitely go, oh, this is great. You know, like, so, so, so the opposite is definitely, uh, you know, definitely true. Well, and, and again, this is all, this is not an abstract concept that we've glommed onto as a civilized species. This is a um, innate, fundamental hardware that we're op all, all of the civilization stuff's built on top of the, the concept that we're talking about. All of our monkey hardware that we never got rid of uh, is there. Like you, you brought up being in a, in a hunter gatherer tribe. Uh, I can get status by being the bully that becomes chief. I can get status by bringing elk back uh, or I can get status by uh, promoting group cohesion through um, enforcing rules or whatever the thing is, right? Like or that's religious, spiritual belief, sacred beliefs, yeah, yeah. spiritual beliefs, yeah. things like it. Mm. And that that's all just fundamentally innate. This is this is they're they're with with avoiding death and and reproducing. This is all wound together. Hundred hundred percent. You know, we've been pursuing status since before we were human. You know, we were up in the trees. We were playing status games. So so you you can't eradicate it. You know that that. that that's what human brains do. It, 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 it's it's in the wiring. You know, it's, it, human brains take the confusion and chaos of reality and they remix it um, in, into into certain predictable ways. And one of those ways is that we, we're constantly playing status games. And it's good. And it's good that we're doing that. It's, you know, the, 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 this fact that we are so preoccupied with proving that we are valuable to the world around us. Yes, it's the worst of us in lots of ways, but it's also the best of us. You know, it's also um, why we have you know civilization itself. So so. so um, you know, we, we, we're, we're very down on status pursuit, um, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a species. Um, but, but, but actually, you know, it's, it's, it, it is the very best of human nature as, and also the very worst. It's kind of both. So, I, okay, it's, it's more or less constant or it's, it's, it, it doesn't abate. I, I assume it's not constant when I'm talking to my dad or something that like in the same way that when I enter a new room of people. But it, it is, is a regular background operating system, it's always going to yeah. be there. Uh, having established that, I would assume that um, you are not agnostic towards productive or healthy status games compared to unproductive or unhealthy status games. There are status games that we would be good to promote as a society and status games that we would be, we would be well advised to try to drop. Absolutely. And then this is one of the great revelations for me personally. I mean, I've always been a lefty, you know, I used to write for the, when I was a journalist, I was mostly writing for the Guardian, you know, like I just died in the world lefty. So my assumption was that, that, that okay, if you want to change the world, if you want to make the world a better place, then of course you've got to play virtue games. You know, the, 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 you know that, that's what we should do. We should be virtuous. But actually, when you look at the history of the world, if you look at the hist history of human life, especially from the um, scientific revolution, the industrial revolution onwards, it's the success games that have saved the world. It's the success games that have, inv that have um, created sanitation and figured out how diseases work and how, how, to, how to get rid of them. It's success games that have, that have, that have kind of built houses and central heating. So, 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 so that's, that, that, that's been the big um, revelation for me. It's like, man, you know, scientists have done more good in the world than a million popes and a million, you know, Dalai Lamas. They, they, they have, you, you know, they've saved billions of lives. I, 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 Neil, Neil Borlaug, Neil Borlaug, who probably saved the most human lives in history by um, revamping the way genetics works in wheat. Like he, he basically, India went single-handedly from a starving country to a net exporter of wheat. He saved a ton wow. of people, um, even though he probably definitively was not as virtuous as Mother Teresa, I would argue has been much, much, much more of a net benefit for mankind. And I'd rather have a bunch of Neil Borlaugs than a bunch of Mother Teresas. 100%. And, and, and you, you also see the dark side of virtue. You know, virtue is always local to your group. The definition of virtue is purely tribal. You know, to the Nazis, Hitler was a good man. To, to the communists, Lenin and Stalin were good men who wanted virtuous things and wanted to make the world a better place. So don't trust your virtue game. You know, don't. Mm. It's a game. You know, it, it's a game. But, but, but you know, with, with the caveat, though, that, um, you know, the, the, the people who are the great leaders of our success games, the, the ones at the top, the, the, they are so driven and so determined to be successful that they that they they can become you know somewhat sociopathic so 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 you still need that element of virtue you still need that pull of 
the virtue people saying, well, hang on a minute, it's great that this massive organization is sending people to Mars or whatever, but also you've got to be making sure you're treating your staff properly and that they, that, that you know, that they have some rights here and that you're paying them correctly. And so, 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 so in the book, you know, as you know, I write about how there's no, there's no pure game. You know, you can say Apple technology company is playing a success game clearly, but they also play a dominance game when they're suing Samsung for patent infringement. They, they, you know, they play a virtue game when they're showing off about their privacy versus, you know, Facebook and Google um, uh, uh, and so on. So, so, so there's no such thing as a pure game. Uh, but I think what, what the, you know, like the, the best kind of games, what I call success virtue games, they're, 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 they, you measure your, your, your status by how successful you've become in achieving this particular aim, whether it's, you know, inventing sort of GM wheat that's going to rescue India. Um, but, but, it, but it ultimately has virtuous ends. I mean, uh, th th those are the kinds of best games. And that, that might be that you're running a, the London Marathon uh, for cancer research, or it might be that you're trying to figure out how we're going to get out of the COVID pandemic by inventing an amazing vaccine. The, these are the kind of what I would call success virtue games. And that, that, that to me is the best of human nature. The worst is, is virtue dominance games, which is about... When, when, yes, when, I, which, which is the bullying, like I, which I, I see in political media a lot, where um, uh, somebody uh, just wants to smack somebody else around. They, they figured out a, uh, a socially acceptable situation where they can be a dick. Under normal circumstances, you wouldn't allow that behavior. But because that person's on the enemy tribe, I, I am allowed to dehumanize them. Yeah, I don't like any of that stuff. It's not fun. I'm very much with you. Uh, I, would, I would love to prioritize success-based uh, status games because that's going to have a runoff effect for society as a whole. Yeah. So noting that in terms of the mechanisms to promote it, um, on a macro level uh, in the United Kingdom, King Charles could really publicize. He's given out knighthoods to scientists and philanthropists and entrepreneurs, and he's not given out as many uh, uh, knighthoods to uh, celebrities and, and people <laughs> who are in reality TV shows or whatever. Uh, in America, we could do Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, I, I don't know. How, how would society as a whole be able to effect a, a positive status game? Wow, that, you know, that, that, that is a good question. I mean, you know, I, I think the ultimate goal is, is, is meritocracy. I mean, you know, it's, 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 since the well, for two or three hundred years in the West, we've, we've been pursuing this idea of human rights. You know, this is this idea that it, it, it's not the tribe that's the, the the most important thing; it's the individual. And and so and so, what we're seeing, and of course, we're in the middle of it. We're still it's still unfolding. We haven't we haven't we haven't finished this project yet. Is is, is this idea that everybody deserves the equal opportunity? to succeed mm -hmm. um and so you know it's very much a live issue at the moment in culture um black white gay straight you know fairness and unfairness um so but so, so so you know but what i see is that is that is that we've we've made enormous strides in these um areas over the last two or three hundred years of course life, life is we haven't, we haven't we haven't we haven't finished this project yet it's still ongoing it's not per it's far from perfect at the moment but that's the ultimate ultimate status game is is that is that we we stop thinking about age skin color gender race and all that stuff and it's and it and, it, and it's and it's a kind of landscape of pure meritocracy that mm. that would be my um my um ultimate goal for perfect status games so so you you would um like my my mind was kind of gravitating towards uh prizes or what the carrots are but you would almost try to figure out ways to remove prestige status from things that we don't think should be allocated status. So like, yeah. like apartheid so, so, would be yeah. a good example of white people should not get automatic status over black people. And let's figure out yeah. how to get rid of those kind of, those kind of uh, systemic problems. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, over here, we still have a problem. We have issues with class, with, with the kind of, you know, with, 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 with in, in the UK, the fairness. We've totally is, solved it over here in America, by the way. We don't have any of those issues. It's well, just you guys more, on the yeah, other like, side of the Atlantic. We're a bit Atlantic. less race conscious than you are, which is great. But we have so many issues with, 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 with class, you know, um, uh, which, which, is, which is still kind of problematic. Um, uh, but, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's how I'd see it. But, but again, with that, with that caveat, though, that... Um, you know, as, as I write in the book, you, you can imagine this future world in which the, the most able people um, or, or, uh, become predictably the elite, um, the, 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 the wealthiest, the most rewarded. But there's still a, a, a kind of unfairness in that because of genetics. You know, some people just don't have the intelligence to succeed at that level. Some people just don't have 
the right kinds of personalities. You know, like um, status games favor in the West extroverts, for example, not introverts. Um, um, it's the opposite in the East. Um, um, so, you know, like um, low, low agreeability as a personality trait is favored because it's because it, you're naturally competitive. You naturally want to yeah. win. So that stuff isn't fair. You're born with a lot of that, you know, already yeah. included in you. So you still need that virtue stuff. You still need that kind of fairness. Um, so, so, so there, there, there would still have to be, um, 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 uh, f for me, you know, a, a kind of social net that, that takes care of people who just for no fault of their own, um, don't have the merit to become sure you know, I, for, for the record like what while i very much want to have this merit-based <laughs> yay success kind of thing i don't want to like revert to some kind of darwinian <laughs> poor people starve to death because we don't need them like i'm not advocating for yeah. that yeah, so, 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 so yeah you, you, yeah i mean you know i, I always love that idea that um was popular when i was you know in my 20s and 30s that sometimes we were referred to as neoliberalism with cushions which is like yes it's let, 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 it's about let, what i want yeah yeah which is I, th I think tony blair talks about that a lot which it, 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 and i love that idea because it is like yeah let, let's let's be competitive let's see, let, let's reward success and let's and if somebody has created a massive amount of value let's rain money down on their heads like completely that's how you know like we, we should be re we should be rewarded for adding value to the world but you know let's have the cushions too like it's it's, it's, it's not as simple as that some people just don't have um the the, the 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 genes or the childhood or the personality in which they can compete with some of these kind of people who are just very lucky to have slipped out of the right womb are there um we, we've we've talked about there being uh beneficial status games versus unhealthy status games and we're yeah. talking we're talking about the the type of status game are there societies that are better at distributing status than others so um like i i don't know maybe during the middle ages only lords and popes got status and everybody else was status deficit or it, it might be the other way around maybe back in the day everybody when they were a part of a little community got to have their status as the you know the local blacksmith and now i'm competing against everybody in the world and so i i don't know are, are, are there periods of time that have greater deficits for the average person in terms of status they crave yeah so well obviously in medieval times when it was the king versus the serfs and the peasants that's a huge you know hu huge status differential um um in the hunter in hunter gatherer tribes in pre-modern tribes there are there is a status game but it's but it's it's much more kind of compressed um so so um uh well and all, know, also we can kill anybody gets too big for their riches if we're, if we're hunter gatherers if, so, if somebody comes in and is like i brought on the elk i get all the women and i'm going to beat everybody with a club it's like no nah, i'm going to kill that guy and sleep with the rock yeah. like i'm not letting him get too far ahead hard to do that with a duke yeah yeah that's right so 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 so, so that's right so so it, it, sometimes just hear, hear researchers talking about hunter gatherer groups as being egalitarian and they're, they're not egalitarian in the sense that they're flat because they're not flat it, it, but, but what surprised me about these groups is that, is that it's very rarely a big man chief figure in these groups like the leadership is um you know um made by consensus there's usually mm -hmm. a group of leaders that sometimes referred to as the cousins even though they're not literal cousins um and 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 it will be kind of domain specific so you know the good hunters will lead the decisions when it comes to hunting and you know the the, the religious people will lead the decisions when it comes to religion so, so so this was you could you could say a kind of healthier way of distributing status for you know mental health perhaps like i i do think that the reason we have such unhappiness in the west um uh, these days so much anxiety so much self-harm and suicide and so on um is, is because the status games that we play are just massive ma massive they're huge we haven't we're not designed to play status games with thousands of other people we're not designed to sit on social media and compare ourselves to taylor swift or lebron james or whoever it might be um and, and i think that's something that especially affects sort of young people but of course it affects mm. all of us um, and so, so i i think um y you know it's, it's very motivating and it pushes us on that kind of um uh, that kind of dynamic but it's also inherently stressful and upsetting and, and then leads to you know raised levels of kind of perfectionism which is bad for us in all kinds of ways um so 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 yeah yeah so yeah i guess it all depends on how you define better like when i was doing my research i was very surprised to find out that sort of pre the neoliberal revolution in the, in, in the uk and the us that that, that life in, in our countries was much more compressed 
Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the economists call that era in America the Great Compression because there was so little, there's relatively little difference between the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. and in those days that, you know, a, 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 you know, a white working class family could still have a holiday and two, two cars parked on the lawn, which they can't do anymore. Um, you know, the top rate of tax stopped at 90% at one point in America in the mid 20th century, which is just extraordinary when you think about it today. So, so, so even 100 years ago, um, um, st the status rewards were much more you might, you might, depending on your point of view, I would say fair. Um, than, than there that, was than also much less cultural variation, at least in the United States. So if you go back to like 1950 and you take the wealthiest people in the country that had home movie theaters before that was a thing, they were still watching Jimmy Stewart films that yeah. all of the poor people were watching in, in uh, regular cinemas. Um, they were eating the same type of food. They were just, they had a personal chef making it, but they were eating meatloaf and they were eating turkey and things like that. Oh. And and so the the variation from you to somebody that outranked you was really just a, a, quanti a quantity type thing as opposed to a qualitative difference. Um, it, so so I, I'm, I'm glad that we're getting back into economics because that's a language that I can kind of speak. So with status, I am assuming status is not a zero sum game in that uh, because there are so many different games we're playing simultaneously, if you do really well as a an author, and I hope you do, by the way, because I loved your book and I, I would love for you to get the, I, I want you to be knighted or whatever the lefty <laughs> version that you like is. But like you you could go do that. But meanwhile, if, if I knock it out of the park in podcasting, it doesn't necessarily detract from your status, does it? No, no. Um, so, 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 so the zero sum game thing is actually quite interesting because it, because the, the, and the answer is it depends. Like you, like some, some status games are zero sum. So, okay. And the example that I use in the, in the book is um, Enron, you know, you know, the Enron. Um, so, so Enron had this um, horrific status game uh, where, where it, was called, it was called the rank and yank system. So every few months, the senior management would get together and sit behind a spreadsheet and literally rank every single member of staff at Enron and the top, I don't know, it's 15% were promoted. The bottom 15% were fired and everybody else was just terrified. So, 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 so that, that kind of environment, that is zero sum, you know, and, and, and that, that, that creates a horrific psychological environment for people to um, exist in. And I would argue, and I do argue in the book is that, is, you know, is, is that this is a you know, big reason why Enron became so corrupt because status was incredibly hard to come by and people started to kind of jealously hoard it um, and, you know, not give it out to each other. And, and, and they, they began breaking the rules. They were so desperate to get it that they, they began breaking every rule they could think of in order to kind of, you know, do their, do a better job for Enron and earn, uh, uh, you know, and gain that status within the group. So the the opposite of Enron, believe it or not, is is CrossFit, the 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 um, <laughs> the, 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 um, the, the the athletic cult. The athletic, the, exactly. It's a cult. It's exactly what it is. I mean, you know, in, in the book, like, but, I, but yeah, I, you, I, using my earlier definition, it okay. Yes. So it it promotes like leanness and good heart rates. Like, all right, cool. That seems like a good cult to put our weight behind. It, it's a very much a success game, uh, and. Um, you, um, and, and you know, as you say, it's a cult. It's well known for being a cult. It's one of those things where if you, if, if someone's a CrossFitter, they'll they'll find some excuse um, within the first sort of four minutes of meeting you to let you know that you're. A, it's like being a vegan or going to Oxford or Cambridge they'll, or Harvard. They'll find a way of letting you know somehow. You know, mm -hmm. so it's one of those things. So it's, it's very much about status. Very much about identity. Very successful. And when psychologists have gone in to kind of examine how why why is CrossFit so much more successful than a, just an ordinary gym, they find that it's about the status. And, and, and so CrossFit's really interesting because it doesn't pit individual member versus individual member. It doesn't create a zero sum game. They have this thing called the workout of the day, which is put on the board and everybody has to do the workout of the day. But the workout of the day is um, adjusted to your particular level of fitness. So you're not competing with anybody else in your group. You're doing the same the same kind of um, task, but with different weights and different strengths. Um, so you're just competing with who you were yesterday. And so, so that's the first thing. It's not zero sum. It's, it's you against you. But the second thing is it's a culturally, culturally critical thing at CrossFit that everybody encourages everybody kind of really strongly and kind of, you know, everybody's like, yeah, you go, you go, you go. So, so, so everybody's made to feel fantastic at CrossFit. And that's why it becomes like a cult. That's why people become addicted to CrossFit because they're addicted to the status which it, which it generates. And, you know, to, to famously, if you know about CrossFit, to the extent that people get sick, like it, like it became a, 
uh, they, they, they discourage it now, but in the early days of CrossFit, it became a badge of honor if you were so exhausted during CrossFit that you vomited. They even wear T-shirts of this kind of of this mascot dragon doing green vomit. You know, like that's really da- like you should. That's so dangerous when you work out that hard that you're sick. Like you, know, you shouldn't do that. But that, but that's but that, that's how addictive it became. That's that's how hard people to kind of drove themselves. Um, and, and it's that, that, all that, about that, that, that's like well, when I was in university, I was in a fraternity, and like some of the fraternities would be like, "Oh man, that guy can." Pass drinks right like it became a status game of how much yeah. alcohol you can imbibe which was a negative one you don't want to encourage that of uh binge <laughs> yeah. drinking yeah yeah um, so, that's, so that's the yeah so so, so 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 they can be zero sum but they don't have to be zero sum is the answer uh you 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 talk in the book about a lot of societal problems coming from this deficit of status so i, I was quite taken in the book um uh you talk about roger elliott uh, a mass shooter um who's a low status male who believes who's probably a narcissist too, who thinks he ought yeah. to be at the top, but uh, that, that gap drove him to madness and killing people. Do would you attribute a lot of the, just kind of the crazy stuff going on in our society right now as uh, to status mismatch? Absolutely. Or status I mean, deficits. Yeah. I mean, you know, I quote a study in there that looks at school shootings in the U S and found that 87% of them were sort of bullied, bullied and excluded, you know, alienated children. So, 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 so that's, that's all about status. And, and, you know, and, and so much of violence is, is, is literally about status. It's about, it's about, it's about t- t- turning a sense of shame, alienation and humiliation into pride. And, and, that, and that's unfortunate. You do, you, 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 especially men, they go to dom- physical dominance. They go, right, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to accept um, the, 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 the judgments of my peers I'm, uh, and I'm going to force them to attend to be in status. So, so, so you, you use you use violence. It, it would seem to me that this is something that we could, as a society, I think everybody in society can have a sense of value and status because yeah. it's not we're not just competing for money. We're not just competing on one spectrum. So, like, I went out and did karaoke last night. Fun time. There's the the table of regulars. You know exactly who they are when you come in. And uh, like they'll get up and you're talking and someone's like, shut up, Bert's singing, you shut up. And like Bert will and like Bert will dominate. Bert is fantastic, right? And like I have no idea what Bert is outside of the karaoke. It's possible Bert has a fairly middling job that he's not very excited about, but Bert has this thing in his life where he can shine and that he yeah. goes to, he goes to karaoke three times a week and he is respected. Like we all have that capacity, right? To find something that we we take our own self-esteem from and we we could all join a club or be, be the best dungeon master or karaoke yeah. or whatever and the, 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 and the, i think that's the really good news about this status research is that it doesn't it's not about money it's not about fame it's not about big cars it's about finding something where you're quite that you're quite good at that you feel like you're above average at and and the fascinating thing about the story of elliot roger for me was that when he did his school shooting it was discovered that he was he used to be very big in the world of warcraft the online world of warcraft world and of course the immediate assumption was that that, 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 the the violence of world of warcraft the computer game created the violence in 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 him but actually i i argue in the book that the 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 the, the literal opposite is true and elliot rogers left behind a hundred and eight thousand word very detailed memoir an autobiography basically saying trying to explain what drove him to do what he did and um you know the world of warcraft was the only world in which he had any status and it's quite mm. it's, it's quite stunning when you read it um so he he ended up feeling quite you know a bit embarrassed when he became a teenager about world of warcraft because it was, it was kind of kind of low status but he he still played it every now and again um and he had these two best friends that he played it with and then one day he found out that they'd been meeting up in secret to play without him and he kind of burst into tears when he when he found this out for, and said and, and promised that he's he was never going to play world of warcraft again and it was literally on that day that he that his kind of hatred and um misery sort of transformed into this really horrific violent misogyny i mean it was on the very same day that that, that happened and so as i write in the book i mean rather and rather than being the source of his his evil i think world of warcraft was the only thing keeping him sane and, and when it and when, and when it was taken away from him that's when he that, that that's when the book goes completely in mad and he starts basically being um writing the most grotesque things about women could could you my my preference would be that everybody finds something that they excel at that they feel valued in i you know karaoke whatever that thing is right uh, you um you you volunteer wonderful thing to derive a sense of that, that would be my preference i'm curious if there's like a technological shortcut you could do 
So for example, if I'm playing virtual reality and every time I win, there's a virtual crowd that claps and says, you're great. Would, would that, would that cover the monkey part of my brain? Would, could I, could I just get well, it out of a device? I, I always think that, you know, we, we've been playing these games for such, for such a long time. We, we're very good at, uh, at spotting. Well, are we? So, 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 so I think we are good at spotting that inauthenticity. And, and so, so there's, there's, there's that kind of uniquely Hollywood Los Angeles thing where everything is amazing and fantastic until they kind of shoot you in the back. Um, so, 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 so I think that isn't to be advised, but then that said, it, it, it has always, um, like, like one of, one of the lessons I learned as a journalist was that you should, you should always, you know, if you're interviewing somebody always ladle them with like, fill them with praise and and like even even though they know that you're kind of being you know sycophantic praise still works somehow it's still it's still it's still we still still find a way to accept it even even though when we, we can suspect it's not particularly authentic we still feel good about it so i i, I, I almost yeah. wonder if there's like a service to be available so like if, if you're watching <laughs> porn very unlikely you're going to impregnate somebody watching porn. Like you're, you're able to trick your evolutionary instincts by watching this glass square of people having sex, right? I almost yeah. wonder if there could be like a call service or an app where you're just like, hey, my name's Bert. <laughs> and it's like, Bert, you're amazing. I love oh you. Everybody's God. wrong. Yeah. Like if you could just like have it on tap. Well, you know, in this in this era of chat GPT, they could actually you could actually get a, an AI to find out some really specific facts about you. And they could say, like, Bert, you know, when you know, when you were 21 and you you won that award for cycling, that was just astonishing. You were better than Bob, uh, weren't you? And, you know, like you could get really specific. That would be really. Yeah, it's kind of like um, status porn. Why not? Well, so uh, we'll 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 wrap up here, but we've we've kind of we've gone through the concept, we've gone from the macro. We're we're now down to the very personal. Um, noting that uh, the status games aren't going away any more than our desire for food, sex, and avoiding death is going away. It's it's built into us. Noting that now that we have this awareness of one of the primary drivers of humankind, what would you advise people just? Folks listening, just regular, not not society, but just the person listening to this. How can we better our lives knowing this? How how can we be less neurotic or more happy being aware of this information? Well, I, I, I you know I, I think a big part of it is simply the idea of you know making the unconscious conscious. I mean, so much of our status play is unconscious, and for me, what I found is just bringing it into consciousness, ha having that awareness that that that. You know what I'm experiencing in that TSAQ or wherever is it, just status. It's just status. It's just you know you're getting upset about this, but it is literally nothing. It's meaningless. So it's mm -hmm. so, you know like you know so 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 having that having that knowledge is hugely kind of you know validate hugely kind of freeing in a way because because you have a new a new a new tool with which to kind of coach yourself as you go through daily life a new understanding um you know when you're kind of being unreasonable and why you're being unreasonable so so that's the first thing um but but, but the, the thing that's had the most effect on me i think in my life is is, is this idea of playing multiple games like um you know we need status status is who we are it's identity it's the me it's, it, you know it's, it's a big part of the meaning of our lives and so if it, it, you know and i think it's probably appropriate in your 20s and early 30s to devote most of your time and attention to one status game because that's when you're establishing yourself so you're building a reputation building a life but when it comes to middle age you need to hedge you need to diversify your status games because if you're just playing one game what's going to happen when you hit 50 55 is inevitably the game you're going to decline the game you you know you're going to get caught up by those young ambitious people things are going to start going wrong um and, and just the ordinary vicissitudes of life you know it's ups and downs and so if all of your status has been invested in one game like for me it was that way but i was a writer and that was it so when things went wrong in my writing world it was a disaster it was a catastrophe it was the anxiety and depression so i've, I've consciously sort of tried to sort of play new status games and i found that it's um it, you know, it really is um, 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 uh, fantastic to have more than one source of status. You do feel much more stable emotionally. And mm. it's almost like you've got a whole new life to be, to, to kind of, you know, a whole new kind of sphere to play the game of life in when you, when you, when you start playing new status games. Uh, all of that makes a great deal of sense to me. The, the first part of your observation almost feels Buddhist, where <laughs> uh, in, in, in Buddhism, you're like, um, you're just becoming aware of what's going on. You're, you still, um, like in Buddhism, there's a difference between uh, pain and suffering. Pain is the stimulus. Suffering is the mental anguish that comes uh, via the, the, the pain. So you can't do anything about the stimulus, but you do have some effect on how bothered you are by it. 
Uh, yeah. So if you're dwelling on it, uh, but if, if you're just like, yep, like that's that's pain. I'm aware of it. Like what's happening? Um, it, it's going to limit the amount of mental anguish that accompanies it. And then the, the diversifying makes a ton of sense to me too. You're uh, you're a great athlete. Um, you will, you know, probably you're not going to be great at boxing in your yeah. 60s. Like that is yeah. uh, like what like I'm probably going to go dancing tonight. I'm going to go two stepping. Now I like I like singing and dancing. I'm like deep down mm-hmm. just a Dick Van Dyke song and dance guy. So I I, I inherently like that. But I also watch, and I'm like, there's a lot of cool 80 year old men here. Like, this is something that I can, <laughs> I could conceivably do this a very long time uh, and be just fine at it. And I'm like, great. So this is this is something that's not a bad idea for me to put some effort into. Yeah, absolutely. And and I also think that you know if you, if if you've spent your 20s and 30s playing success games, try well, try and play a virtue game. You know, like you mentioned volunteering. You know, volunteer. Mm-hmm. Like it's a you know that, that that's another way of kind of broadening you know you're broadening who you are you're kind of rewriting who you are as a as a, as a human it really is um, um um a powerful thing to do wonderful well uh will store uh you have been a delight i am always so thrilled when i like authors in addition to enjoying their work uh you seem like a great guy and i enjoyed talking to you i loved the status game uh, i highly recommend it for people that are listening to the show if you go to amazon or anywhere else you can go to mightyheaton.com slash featured you will see mr store's book as long as well as the others that we, we mentioned on the show but you've written a bunch of other books do you want to pitch any others before we leave no i'm happy with the status game. thank you <laughs> <laughs> you've been more Great. than generous <laughs> thank you very much 